that we know the basic structure of the parliament, let us go ahead to study, in today's session, the powers of the Union Legislature and the Legislative Procedure. The Parliament of India is a bicameral legislature. Bicameral means having a system dealing with two chambers. Bi stands for dual and camera is the Latin term which means chambers. It consists of the two houses, Rajya Sabha and Lok Sabha, and the President of India. Now, the Parliament makes laws with the help of both the chambers. Laws passed by the Parliament and approved by the President are enforced in the whole country. Let us go on to studying the powers of the Union Legislature. The Indian Constitution lays down the division of legislative powers between the Union and the State Government in the 7th Schedule of the Constitution. The executive powers of the Union and State Governments coexist with their legislative powers. The powers of the Union and the State Governments are enlisted under three lists known as the Union List, the State List and the Concurrent List. Under List 1, that is the Union List, the powers of the Union Government are mentioned. It contains 97 subjects. Under the second list, that is the state list, 61 subjects are mentioned on which the state legislatures can enact laws. Under the third list, that is the concurrent list, are mentioned the powers that are to be concurrently exercised by both the union and the state governments. And there are 47 subjects mentioned in this. Now, the residual powers, that means the remaining powers, which are not listed or included in these three lists, they belong to the union. There are, however, three conditions which are attached to this division. Let's take a look at these three conditions. First, the law of the union is final. If at all there is a conflict upon a law between the state and the union, it is the union's law that will hold ground and will prevail. If a law is of national importance, then the parliament will make laws. Third, in case of national emergency, the parliament may legislate on any of the state subjects. All matters that hold national importance, they come under the union's control. For example, matters that relate to defense, security of the country, external affairs, minting of currency, banking, interstate rivers and valleys, interstate trade and commerce, major industries, development and regulation of oil fields and mines, etc. Now let us move on to the process of lawmaking in India. One of the most important functions of the parliament is to make laws for the entire country. So how exactly do our MPs do this? Now there is a thorough procedure the MPs have to follow in order to bring a new law into existence. In a welfare state like ours, the purpose of the law is to mitigate public hardships. That means to reduce public hardships to the greatest extent possible, to curb social, political and economic evils and to ensure justice for all. These laws are made at the central level and by the state legislative assemblies at the state level, as we have already discussed in the earlier part of the video. Now, in order to conduct, facilitate and discuss any business or transaction, what will you need first? You will obviously need a substantial group of stakeholders, decision makers, those who will discuss the law. You need the presence of people involved. So what is required is at least a minimum number of members to officially participate in the lawmaking process. This strength of the parliament is called the quorum. Now no procedure can take place in either of the houses without the required quorum. And what is the required quorum? Per sitting, 
of either house should consist of one tenth of the total number of its members. This is according to Article 103 of the Constitution. Making is a complex process, and the Constitution of India prescribes that it be done under three stages. We shall take a look at these stages. At the first stage, the bill is introduced. The bill embodies the proposed law along with the statement of objects and of reasons. This introduction is also known as the first reading of the bill. There are two types of bills, ordinary bills and money bills. A bill other than finance or money bill may be introduced in either house of the parliament and requires to be passed in both the houses before it can be presented for the president's assent. Bills may be public bills which are introduced by a minister and it needs a seven-day notice period. Bills could also be private bills that is introduced by anyone but a minister. Such bills, they need a month's notice period. Every bill that is introduced in the House now has to be published in the Gazette. A Gazette is an official journal that contains legal and state notices and information. Usually, no debate takes place at the time a bill is introduced. The member who introduces the bill may make a brief statement indicating broadly the aims and objectives of the bill. If the bill is opposed at this stage, one of the members opposing the bill is allowed to give his reasons. After this, the question is put to vote. If the House is in favour of the introduction of the bill, then it goes to stage 2. In the second stage, there are four alternatives. Now, after a bill is introduced, it may be taken into consideration or referred to a select committee of the House, usually known as the Standing Committee, or referred to a joint committee of both the Houses, or circulated for gathering public opinion. Now, the first three options are used in case of a routine legislation. The last option is usually opted for when the proposed law is of a controversial nature. When the motion of the bill is carried out, the principles of the bill and its general provisions may be discussed. If the bill is taken into consideration, changes to the bill and clause by clause consideration of the provisions of the bill is undertaken. If the bill is referred to the select committee of the House, it considers the bill and then submits its report to the House. Then the clauses of the bill are again open to consideration and further amendments are allowed. This is the most time-consuming stage. Once the clause-by-clause clause consideration is over and every clause is voted for, the second reading of the bill finally comes to an end. Let us now take a look at the third stage of the legislative procedure. In this third stage, the member in charge moves that the bill be passed. At the third reading, the progress of the bill is quick. Only verbal and purely formal amendments are moved and the discussion is extremely brief. Once all the amendments are disposed, the bill is finally passed in the house where it was introduced. After this, it is transmitted to the other house for its consideration. Now, when the bill comes up for consideration by the other house, it has to undergo all the stages as in the originating house. The process is the same. There are three options before the house. First, it may finally pass the bill as sent by the originating house. Second, it may reject the bill altogether or amend it and then return to the originating house. And third, it may not take any action on the bill and if more than six months pass after the date of receipt of the bill, this means the bill is rejected. So three things may happen. The bill may be passed, the bill may be amended or the bill may be altogether rejected. When the bill has been returned along with changes to the originating house, the house then reconsiders the bill. If it accepts the amendments, 
it sends a message to the other house relating the same. If it does not accept the amendments, then the bill is returned to the other house with a message relaying the same. Now, in case both the houses do not come to an agreement, the president intervenes. He calls for a joint sitting of the two houses. The disputed provision is finally adopted or rejected by a simple majority of vote of those who are present and voting. The final stage of the lawmaking procedure is getting the assent of the president. A bill that is finally passed by both the houses is now presented with the signature of the speaker to the president for his assent. This is as per Article 111 of the Indian Constitution. Now, if the president gives the assent, the bill then becomes an act and is placed in the statute book. If the president withholds his assent, there is an end to the bill. The president may also choose to return the bill for reconsideration of both the houses with a message requesting them to reconsider it. If, however, the houses pass the bill again with or without any amendments, then the bill is presented to the president again for his assent for the second time. Now, this time the president has no power to withhold his assent. Thus, lawmaking is long, cumbersome and time-consuming procedure. It becomes difficult to pass a bill in a short time. Proper drafting of the bill saves time and skillful soliciting of the opposition support makes the task easier. Money bills, they follow a slightly different procedure. Let us study about it. A money bill is any bill which relates to revenue and expenditure and is declared so by the Speaker. A money bill cannot be introduced in the Rajya Sabha. Once the money bill is passed by the Lok Sabha, it is transmitted to the Rajya Sabha. The Rajya Sabha cannot reject a money bill. The Rajya Sabha must return the money bill to the Lok Sabha within 14 days of receipt, upon which the Lok Sabha may either accept or reject any of the recommendations made by the Rajya Sabha. If the Lok Sabha accepts any of the recommendations, the bill is deemed to have been passed by both the houses. Even if the Lok Sabha does not accept any of the recommendation, the bill is considered to be passed by both the houses without any amendments. If a money bill passed by the Lok Sabha and transmitted to the Rajya Sabha for further recommendations has not returned within 14 days, it is considered to have been passed by both the houses at the expiry of the mentioned period in the original form. With this we end today's session.